Over the years, several articles in respected journals and newspapers, several documentaries by Frontline and PBS, among other networks, and a 2011 film, Anonymous, have pushed the views of those who question Shakespeare's authorship into the limelight, granting them a veneer of academic normalcy and pseudo-scholarship, when in fact they are neither the academic norm nor scholastically sound. Yet, those who question Shakespeare's authorship seem to be getting louder. Their anachronistic understanding of Shakespeare's time and theater is no more evident than in the fact that more than 150 years passed after Shakespeare's death before there is any record of anyone ever doubting Shakespeare's authorship. For more than 150 years, everyone knew that the man from Stratford was the author of his own plays. This fact alone speaks volumes about the motives and the ethnocentricity of those attempting to rewrite Shakespeare's history and the historical vacuum in which they operate. In 1769, well over 150 years after Shakespeare's death, Herbert Lawrence, in his book The Life and Adventures of Common Sense, nominated Francis Bacon as the supposed real Shakespeare. Since then, at least two dozen other nominees have been offered, including Christopher Marlowe, Sir Walter Riley, the Earl of Oxford Edward de Vere, and even Queen Elizabeth herself. Since none of these groups can agree on who is supposed to have written Shakespeare's plays, only that Shakespeare apparently could not, I will refer to them collectively as anti stratfordians the following are the primary arguments that anti stratfordians forward to dismiss Shakespeare as the author of his plays. One, Shakespeare was a commoner without a university education. Two, only a nobleman could depict courtly life so accurately in his plays. Three, Shakespeare left no books or manuscripts in his will to indicate literacy, let alone scholarship. Four, we can find no correspondence between Shakespeare and his contemporaries, and there is no indication that he knew any other literary man of his time. And five, the various spellings of his name indicate different men named Shakespeare existed, or his signatures indicate that he couldn't even spell his own name correctly, let alone write such great works of literature. Let's consider these arguments one at a time. Argument number one, that Shakespeare was a commoner without a university education. Well, Shakespeare was not a commoner. He was born into an upper middle class family. His mother, Mary Arden, was from a family of status, and her ancestors had connections in society. The Arden family had been prominent in Warwickshire since before the Norman Conquest. She was the daughter of a wealthy landowner and inherited her father's farm. Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare, was elected to several municipal offices, serving as an alderman and culminating in a term as bailiff, the chief magistrate of the town council, and mayor of Stratford in 1568. John Shakespeare was granted a coat of arms five years before his death, most likely at the instigation and expense of his playwright's son, who had to plunk down a considerable amount of money for it. Shakespeare could do this only because by the late 1500s, the man from Stratford had become a very wealthy man and had acquired substantial land holdings. Note that the spear across the coat of arms is clearly a play on the bard's name, Shakespeare. The following continuum represents a fair approximation of the Elizabethan class system, from top to bottom the aristocracy, knights, gentry, yeomen, tradesmen and craftsmen, husbandmen, and laborers. At his death, coming from two families, the Ardens and the Shakespeare's, who both held coats of arms, William Shakespeare was a gentleman, and therefore part of the gentry. He most certainly was not a commoner. However, if we accept the anti stratfordians definition of commoner, then do you know who else must be considered a commoner? and who was also without a university education? Ben Jonson, 
That's right, Shakespeare's contemporary, who was, by the way, England's unofficial poet laureate, and considered by most until the beginning of the 18th century a better playwright than William Shakespeare, and certainly considered more scholarly. In fact, Johnson was considered the most learned playwright of his time over others like Christopher Marlowe, who did in fact attend a university. Born to very humble beginnings, Ben Johnson lacked the resources for a university education, and he was forced to turn to his stepfather's trade of brick lane before eking out a living as a playwright. There is no difference in education between Johnson and Shakespeare. Both attended grammar schools, and yes, Shakespeare, as the son of a prominent city official and upper middle class family, certainly attended grammar school. And like Shakespeare, Johnson never received a university education. Yet, no one questions Johnson's scholarly work as his own. Another playwright of the time without a university education was Thomas Kidd a highly popular and influential playwright who was the author of The Spanish Tragedy, a play so popular that many of his contemporaries imitated it, including Shakespeare in his play Hamlet. Thomas Middleton, who was one of the few Renaissance dramatists to achieve equal success in comedy and tragedy, was also without a university education, having dropped out of Oxford. The anti stratfordians simply do not know or fail to acknowledge the rigorous literary education boys received prior to attending a university, nor do they understand the way men continued to be self-taught without a university education in Renaissance England, which accounts for such literary figures as Ben Jonson who, like Shakespeare, did not attend a university. Shakespeare even left us clues about the rigors of his early education, amusingly dramatized in Act 4, Scene 1 in his The Merry Wives of Windsor, set in a very Stratford-like English town, where a lad named William is put through the paces by a schoolteacher who threatens the boy with whipping if he falters in his recitation of Latin. However, even Johnson, in his great tributary poem, acknowledges Shakespeare's limitations in formal learning, specifically in Latin and Greek. In his poem, we read, For if I thought my judgment were of years, I should commit thee, Shakespeare, surely with thy peers, and tell how far thou didst our lily outshine, or sporting kid, or Marlowe's mighty line. And though thou had small Latin and less Greek, from thence to honor thee I would not seek. Johnson's point here is that despite having small Latin and less Greek, Shakespeare still outshines his contemporaries, John Lilly, Thomas Kidd, and even Christopher Marlowe, who demonstrate far greater aptitude for language in their plays, but are still outdone by Shakespeare overall. Shakespeare's limited formal education is candidly admitted here by Johnson, who, having very little formal education himself, sees nothing odd about Shakespeare being able to best his university-educated contemporaries. Argument 2. That only a nobleman could depict courtly life so accurately in his plays. <laughs> The idea that Shakespeare's plays must have been produced by an aristocratic writer because he was supposedly accurate in his depiction of the nobility and monarchy is unheard of before the 19th century, because anyone living in the 17th or even the 18th century would have found the idea laughable. Indeed, critics from the 17th century onward depicted Shakespeare as a natural genius and often criticized what they saw as his lack of courtly knowledge. One of the most notable commentaries on Shakespeare's lack of accuracy in depicting courtly life is found in the writings of John Dryden. In his Of Dramatic Poesy, composed in 1668, he compares the writings of Beaumont and Fletcher, neither of whom are noblemen either, to those of William Shakespeare. They, Beaumont and Fletcher, understood and imitated the conversation of gentlemen much better. Later, in his essay on the dramatic poetry of the last age, composed in 1673, Dryden wrote, I cannot find that any of them, speaking of all Elizabethan dramatists, 
had been conversant in courts, except Ben Johnson, and his genius lay not so much that way as to make an improvement by it. Dryden was writing only 57 years after Shakespeare's death, and was himself quite familiar with courtly life. Only one completely unfamiliar with Elizabethan courtly life would argue that Shakespeare depicted it accurately. Nonetheless, Shakespeare did in fact have some idea of courtly life, first as a member of the Chamberlain's men as early as 1594, and then of course as the king's playwright, leading the king's men. He also had a well-documented friendship with the Earl of Southampton, a lord, who would have introduced him to courtly life early in his career. Lastly, the same argument can be turned on its head. If only a nobleman can depict courtly life, well then surely only a country boy can depict country life and do it as accurately as Shakespeare does in his plays. The idiosyncratic spelling of words in his plays betrays the writer as being of Warwickshire County origins. Shakespeare's plays even use Warwickshire words for country living. He calls the gnats around the cows the breeze, as only the Warwickshire plowman did. He calls the turn at the top of a furrow the hayed land, as Warwickshire farmers did. He uses scores of country names for plants and flowers, from Lark's Hills to Deadman's Fingers to Catesies, that only one raised in the country, where Shakespeare was bred, would know. Though certainly not very familiar with Elizabethan courtly life, whoever authored Shakespeare's plays must have been a Warwickshire country lad, intimately familiar with country life. Argument 3. Shakespeare left no books or manuscripts in his will to indicate literacy, let alone scholarship. <laughs> the fact that there are no books mentioned in Shakespeare's will is inconsequential. Wills at this time were accompanied by an inventory in which books were accounted among the goods and chattel of the household. We do not have the accompanying inventory to Shakespeare's will, so we do not know what happened to all of his books. We can assume that they were transferred on to Susanna, his eldest daughter, who, as inscribed on her tombstone, was, quote, witty above her sex, and, thus the inscription continues, quote, something of Shakespeare was in that. Her tomb's inscription is a tribute as much to her father's genius and wit as it is to her own. Susanna, witty above her sex, married Dr. John Hall. The lack of books in Elizabethan wills says nothing at all about whether the person had a library or was a man of letters. What we do find in Shakespeare's will is evidence that the man of Stratford is the same man of the theater in London. When he died, Shakespeare's will leaves the bulk of his estate to his family in Stratford, but quite a bit of money is also left to various actors in London, two actors of the Kingsmen, for which Shakespeare was the playwright. Argument 4. We can find no correspondence between Shakespeare and his contemporaries. Well, this is simply not true. We have a surviving letter written to Shakespeare by Richard Quinney, the father of Thomas Quinney, who would later marry Shakespeare's younger daughter, Judith. The letter, written in 1598, was addressed to Shakespeare in London. Quinney, from Stratford, was in London to petition the Privy Council for a new, more favorable charter for Stratford. On October 25th, he wrote to his loving, good friend and countryman, Mr. William Shakespeare asking for a sizable loan. Shakespeare of Stratford is by this time clearly a man of influence and wealth in London, since his friend from Stratford is asking him for a loan equivalent to thousands of dollars in U.S. currency today. Shakespeare, now in London, has connections, and this is why Quinney, a friend from Stratford, is writing him. Unlike Shakespeare, in the case of Christopher Marlowe, we can find no letters written by Christopher Marlowe to any of his contemporaries or any addressed to him. No correspondence at all. Yet, no one doubts that Christopher Marlowe wrote the plays and poems ascribed to him. That Shakespeare and Ben Jonson knew each other is beyond doubt not only because of the tone in Johnson's written references to him, but because Shakespeare's company produced a number of Johnson's plays. 
That there is no preserved written correspondence between them is inconsequential. Why would they write to each other? There's no need to write to the friends one sees and drinks with regularly. John Ward's description of Shakespeare's death in his diary notes nothing out of the ordinary when he states that Shakespeare, Drayton, and Ben Jonson had a merry meeting, and it seems drank too hard. Shakespeare and his contemporaries were friends, and they drank together. We know this. Argument number five. There is some significance in the various spellings of Shakespeare's name. These notions about spelling are usually accompanied by uninformed assertions that the names must have belonged to different people or were indicative of an illiterate man who couldn't even spell his own name. Let's be clear, Elizabethan spelling was very erratic by 21st century standards. There is considerable evidence that the spellings of names were interchangeable, as was the spelling of most words during this time. For example, Surviving references spell Christopher Marlowe's name every way from Marley to Marlin, but almost never Marlowe, as we spell it today. In fact, Marlowe even spelled his own name, Christopher Marley. Apparently, Marlowe couldn't even spell his own name correctly either. In 1594, the year after he was murdered, Cortos of two of Christopher Marlowe's plays, Dido, Queen of Carthage, and Edward II, were published with the names Christopher Marlowe and Chris Marlowe, respectively, on their title pages. Thus, even publishers within the same year felt at liberty to interchange the spelling of Marlowe's name, one with a final E and one without. Or maybe, just maybe, there were two different Marlowe's, too. We also have several signatures of Philip Hinslow, an accomplished Elizabethan theatrical actor and well-known entrepreneur. He spelled his name at least a dozen different ways in his personal and professional papers. This is not odd or out of the ordinary for the time. There is no significant difference in spelling patterns when we take into account handwritten versus printed or Stratford versus London spellings. Whether in a literary or a non-literary context, Shakespeare's name is spelled multiple ways. And in both contexts, the traditional spelling is the most prevalent. We have six known signatures of William Shakespeare, and none of them is spelled alike. Shakespeare never spelled his own name the same way twice, but neither did Henslow or other men of his time. Men even spelled the names of others differently when copying them from printed documents in their possessions. Sometime in 1609, Sir John Harrington made a list of all the quartos he owned, including a 1608 copy of King Lear of Shakespeare. In his list, however, in the 1608 quarto, the name is spelt Shakespeare with a hyphen. So Harrington didn't even copy the name over the same way. In June 12, 1593, Richard Stoneley purchased a copy of the newly published Venus and Adonis with the dedication signed William Shakespeare, the traditional spelling. However, in his notebook, Stoneley wrote Venus and Adonis per Shakespeare, again, failing even to copy the name correctly into his notebook. On June 19, 1609, Edward Allen noted his purchase of Shakespeare's sonnets, as it is called on the title page, writing down Shakespeare's sonnets. Again, the writer seems unconcerned about the spelling of the author's name or even the word sonnets, as recorded on the original. There is no definitive or correct spelling of a person's name in Elizabethan England. And there is no evidence whatsoever that hyphenation in Elizabethan times was ever thought to indicate a pseudonym. Other proper names of Shakespeare's contemporaries were also sometimes hyphenated. The entire argument about spelling is baseless and pitifully uninformed. Above all, there is insurmountable positive evidence placing William Shakespeare of Stratford in London between 1592 and 1612, connecting him with the theatrical scene there and identifying him with the published plays that derived from public performances that bear his name. We have more information about William Shakespeare than we have of most of his contemporaries, with more than 50 contemporary documents and records surviving that mention the playwright by name. <laughs>
Shakespeare was frequently praised in writing as a poet and a playwright and named as the author of many of his works while he was alive, which is more than we can say for Christopher Marlowe, who wasn't. The question of authorship stems from a double standard of anachronistic expectations applied to Shakespeare, but not his contemporaries. And it comes from a very ill-informed notion of who the man from Stratford really was, how accurate his plays really were, what wills looked like during the Renaissance, what contemporary correspondence with Shakespeare we do in fact have, how learned men spell their own names as well as those of others, and how plays were created in Renaissance theater. Professor Peter Sacchio explains. Theater is a collaborative art, and people in the theater always know what other people in the theater are doing. Even now, in the much larger world of the New York theater, everybody in it knows everybody else. Everybody knows if someone is ghostwriting someone else. Everybody knows if a new director has been brought in to fix a play. Everybody knows who's understudying such and such a play. Um, Everybody knows who's sleeping together. In the much smaller world of Shakespeare's theater, in London of 1600, when probably no more than 200 people were trying to get a living out of putting on plays at any given time, it is unimaginable that three dozen successful plays could be written by someone other than the man to whom they were publicly attributed without someone leaving some statement about the hoax. No such statement exists because there was no such hoax. For more than 150 years after his death, no one questioned Shakespeare as the author of his works because he was, and is, the author of his works. (laughs) 